our job is to address what what is presented, and this is the reality that is presented, and this is what we will deal with. On the coronavirus situation, uh, there's a lot to learn from what we just went through, and I believe it's a transformative situation for society and something we can really learn from going forward. Coronavirus was a medical issue, was a public health issue, was an economic issue, but more than anything, it was a social issue. Uh, it was about how people behave, right? And to address coronavirus, what we really had to do was change society. It was not a government operation. It was not something I could do governmentally. People had to do it. Government could provide leadership, uh, and we had an operational component, but it was about people making the changes that had to be made. They had to accept it. They had to understand it. They had to change their behavior. That is a monumental undertaking, always. Social change, when does social change happen? Social change happens when people are presented with the facts, they understand the facts, they believe the facts, there's a plan forward based on the facts, and people care enough to make a difference. With coronavirus, I sat up here every day and I said, here are the facts. Here are the number of deaths. Here are the hospitalizations. This is what we're looking for. Here's a plan that I think can take us forward based on those facts. People were motivated because it was about life and death and about their life and death and about their family's life and death. And uh, we went forward. Compare that coronavirus situation to the situation we're in with the social unrest we see, people have seen Mr. Floyd's murder. They're watching what's going on on the streets every day. And they're saying uh, enough is enough. And it's what they are seeing and what they know uh, that is disturbing. And we're going to show you again for those of you who haven't seen a couple, a scene from Buffalo and a scene from New York City, because this is a story all across the state. This is Buffalo, New York yesterday. I just spoke with uh, Mr. Gugino on the phone, who is that gentleman, uh, who thankfully is alive. But you see that video, and it disturbs uh, your basic sense of decency and humanity. Uh, why? Why? Why was that necessary? Where was the threat? Uh, older gentleman, where was the threat? And then you just walk by the person while you see blood coming from his head. And police officers walk by. It's just fundamentally offensive and frightening. It's just frightening. You say, like, who are we? How did we get to this place? Incidents of pushing the press, you have incidents of police getting hit with bricks in the head. You say, where are we? Who are we? And these are undeniable situations. Buffalo situation, I want to applaud Mayor Byron Brown. Mayor of Buffalo suspended the police officers yesterday, uh, immediately. And uh, I believe the district attorney is, is looking into it from a uh, possible criminal liability point of view, and I applaud the, the district attorney for moving quickly, but uh, people see this. They see the facts. Now, when you have all this emotion, you have to focus on the facts and, uh, on, and the intelligence of the matter, right? It can't be about emotion. Of course, police must protect the public safety, and police must protect themselves. That's a fact. Uh, of course, there are also cases of police abuse and the abuse of power. That's a fact. 
you can have two coincident facts. Mr. Floyd's murder was the breaking point of a long list of deaths that were unnecessary and which were abusive. That is a fact. And people are saying enough is enough. Uh, that is a fact. What people are saying is we must change and we must stop the abuse. And that is a fact. And New York should be at the forefront of that. That has always been New York's legacy as the progressive capital. We are the ones who hold the standard of what is the right progressive reform. And uh, New York uh, should pass next week what we call the Say Their Name Reform Agenda. Say Their Name Reform Agenda comes from the long list of names of people who we have seen who have been abused by uh, police officers, uh, by the criminal justice system. And Mr. Floyd is just the last name on a very long list. Fine, enough is enough. Change the law, take the moment, reform. There are four cornerstones for our Say Their Name Reform agenda. One, transparency of prior disciplinary records of a police officer. Uh, if they're being charged and investigated for abuse, their prior disciplinary record is relevant. And by the way, it's relevant one way or the other. If there were no other disciplinary proceedings, that can exonerate the person who is charged. If there are prior disciplinary uh, proceedings for this type of behavior, then yes, it is evidentiary. But people should know. Uh, Chokeholds, we went through this with Eric Garner. Uh, again, you saw it with Mr. Floyd's death, but we learned it first with Eric Garner and many, many other cases, by the way. Why? Uh, we've seen 9-11 calls, which are race-based false calls. A false 9-11 call based on race should be uh, classified as a hate crime in the state of New York. Uh, we know that it's wrong for the local district attorney to investigate the police force from that county. By executive order, I did the attorney general as an independent prosecutor. That should be codified in law. I did it five years ago. But these are the cornerstones of a real reform agenda that can address what is going on on the, on the street. Uh, reform works for everyone's interest here. Stopping police abuse vindicates the overwhelming majority, 99.9% .9 of the police, who are there to do the right thing and do do the right thing every day. It restores the confidence, the respect, and the trust that you need to make this relationship work. You have to heal the police community relationship. That has to happen for the sake of the police and for the sake of the community. You look at this looting that's been going on in New York City. This hurts poor communities and distressed communities. You saw many businesses destroyed that are relied upon by that community. You can't have the relationship that works one way or the other. And even in this politically partisan, racially charged environment, there is still a truth and there are still facts. And that's what we have to focus on. That was the truth with the coronavirus. Even though it was all political and everything was partisan and Democrat, Republican and red and blue, it was never, they offer us false choices. COVID, coronavirus, well, do you want to save people's lives or reopen the economy? And you should reopen the economy and forget public health. Or you should take care of people's health but not reopen the economy. It was never either or. It can't be either or. I know uh, from a, a hyperbolic, rhetorical, partisan, 
It's one or the other. Liberate New York. Uh, worry about health. Close New York. It was never one or the other. That was unintelligent. It was always both. It's the same situation here. It's not a question of public safety or civil rights. Whose side are you on, public safety or civil rights? It can't be either or. It can't be police safety or prosecutor safety. Pick a side. Which are you on, red or blue, Democrat or Republican? Who are you with? You have to be with both. Yes, you need public safety. And yes, you need civil rights. Yes, you need police to be safe. And yes, you need the protesters to be safe. These are false choices. We need both. Even in this hysterical moment, you need to be able to hold two truths in your, in your hands at the same time. How do we change society to make these reforms happen? How do you have a new societal awareness? Can you do that? Can you change behavior to respect one another? You're darn right you can. We know we can because we just did it through this coronavirus in a very fundamental way. You changed people's fundamental behavior, whether or not they leave the house, whether or not they go to school, whether or not they go to work. They changed themselves remarkably fast and remarkably effective. We have the lowest number of deaths from coronavirus that we have had since this started. 42 deaths, the lowest number since we started. Eight weeks ago, we had 800. Eight weeks, 800 people die to 42 people die in eight weeks. Amazing. How did you do that? I did nothing. The people of the state radically changed how they behaved. Look at that progress. Lowest number of hospitalizations to date in a matter of weeks. So we know we can change. And we know we can change dramatically. People are focused. We have a plan. And that's when social reform happens, when people are motivated and people are focused. That was the Civil Rights Act nationally. That was the Triangle Shirtways Factory Fire which changed labor rights in this nation. That was the environmental movement after Storm King. That was the revolution of LGBTQ rights after Stonewall. That's what we just saw in coronavirus, which will go down in history as one of the great transformational moments of society. And this is a moment to lead in terms of social change. And we will do it because we are New York tough, smart, united, disciplined, loving, and that is what the moment requires. Thank you. Questions? Yesterday, yesterday night, we saw medics and lawyers, peaceful observers, delivery drivers, all be arrested and be assaulted by police officers. At this point in time, do we think that the curfew is serving its initial purpose of protecting the public, and should we rethink it at this point? Uh, curfew is a local decision, as you know. It's made by mayor, uh, mayors across the state. Uh, I support their decisions. Uh, the police need to uh, protect the demonstrators, uh, protect public safety, but they need to deal with the looters. And what the looters are doing, what looting is, is people exploiting the fact that police are busy. Oh, police are busy. We can now go loot because the police are busy with the protesters. Uh, the curfews are designed to uh, let the police be in a posi position where they can stop the looting. And that has been a serious problem in uh, many cities. The first answer is deploy enough police. A place like New York City, you can do that. You have 36,000 police. Some cities, you don't have enough police. Uh, you don't have a size of a force that can do everything. But that's a, a local decision. And look, it has been better over the past few days. You look at New York City. 
uh, looting, it was on the edge of chaos. On the edge of chaos. And now you have, uh, now you have people who, uh, a police force in the city that is adequately deployed. You have enough police. It's a better, they have a better management plan. And you have not seen the looting the past couple of days. The entire process, pro protests have been sparked by the over-policing of black and brown communities. Why is it that more law enforcement is needed when the thing that they're protesting against Have you is seen the videos of the looting? I've seen the videos of okay. the looting. Okay. So if that was your business that was just pushed. destroyed or your house that was just destroyed, you would understand why you need police because your house was just destroyed. Governor, with all due respect, you announced the curfew with Mayor de Blasio. Yes. So what is your opinion about this? The, the clashes that you have just highlighted are in large part because of the enforcement of the curfew. Do you think the curfew is, is serving its purpose at this point, or should it be canceled? It has been canceled in other cities. Yeah, well, let's just, I know you're the Times, but you don't get to make up your own facts, right? Okay. The curfew is a local decision, right? It is not a state curfew. It's a local curfew. Cities put the curfew in. I do not put the curfew in. You are right. I announced the curfew with Mayor de Blasio in New York City after a night of looting and craziness at 11 o'clock. The mayor then revised the curfew, right, to 8 o'clock and extended it, which I had nothing to do with. It's a matter of fact, right? Mr. Jesse, yes, that's the fact. So start with facts, that's what I'm trying to say. Start with facts and then have an opinion. If you have your own facts, then you have your own opinion. But people, let me finish, people don't get to have their own facts because then you have all these different opinions because they have their own facts. So New York Times or not, you still have to have facts. Your facts were wrong. These are the facts. It's a, hold it, hold it. It's a city decision. I announced the New York City one with the mayor at 11. He then went to 8 o'clock and has extended it, which I've said nothing on. I support the mayor's decisions. They are on the ground. They're working with their local police department. Uh, if they believe a curfew is necessary, I support their decisions. So you believe it's still a good idea yeah, despite I support, these clashes? I support the mayor's decisions. I think the looting and the rampant criminality was much worse. Uh, the situation we were in in New York City, uh, which spurred the curfew, was much worse. And what we have seen over the past couple of days is better in New York City. Better. It is better. And that's undeniable, by the way. On Buffalo, do you think the officers involved in that incident should be fired by the city? And as a follow-up, when you first saw that video, what, what was your reaction? I was sick to my stomach. Sick to my stomach. It was the same feeling I've had for 90 of the past nights when I would get the death total from coronavirus. I would physically get sick to my stomach. And when I saw the video, I got sick to my stomach. Not to be overly graphic, uh, but that is the answer to your question. Uh, I think Mayor Brown was 100% right in suspending the police officers last, last night. I think he acted quickly and appropriately, and I applaud that. Uh, I, the firing is then a contractual collective bargaining question, right? Uh, how do you go from suspension to firing by that contract and the process? Uh, but I would say I think the uh, city should pursue firing, and I think the district attorney should uh, look at the situation for possible criminal charges. Uh, and I think that should be done on an expeditious basis. We, we saw in Minneapolis that people want answers and they want accountability, 
and they want it quickly, you know, the wheels of justice move slowly. Yet they don't have to. They can move fast. You can turn the crank faster. Uh, and I would encourage the district attorney not to do what happened in Minneapolis, which was the delay itself caused issues. Remember the district attorney came out and said initially, uh, well, there's other evidence that suggests something else. You know, people don't want vagary. People are upset, they're angry, they're frustrated. Give me an answer, give me an answer quickly. Uh, explain it to me. If there's something you know that I don't know, tell me what you know. I'm tired of secrets uh, by government. So I would encourage the district attorney to move quickly and fairly, but quickly. And I think the mayor should, the police chief, uh, should pursue firing and go through whatever process they have to go through. But again, look, the mayor suspended those two cops uh, very quickly, and I respect that. Considering going out to any of these protests in either a show of solidarity to both the protesters and the police, as you have made a distinction between the two. But there have been protests in Albany, there's one scheduled in nearby Troy for Sunday, or, or even New York City, Buffalo, Rochester. Do you think that would be helpful to both um, the cops and the protesters if you were out there? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm talking to everyone right now. I'm also talking to the legislature about a session that's going to happen on Monday. Uh, and that's, that's going to be a focus over the weekend. But we'll see how it goes. No, Sir? The governor, we've seen, other, we've seen other leaders out there. There's a trend since race when it comes to this issue, and that is based on what the fundamental function of a police officer is. It attracts a certain percentage of people with toxic personality traits like hyperaggression. Is that true? And if so, is there any way to actually address that legislatively? With all due respect to what we see here, most of this is on the back end once the damage is done. And you can ban a chokehold, but there are other ways that police can cause damage. And there are uses of force, which kind of goes back to, are the best people doing the job? What, what is your opinion on that common thought? Well, look, you have sophisticated tech testing mechanisms that are used uh, to hire police. Uh, you have civil service tests that are used to hire police. You have training of police, et cetera. Uh, I, I don't know that there's any credence in that this occupation attracts a certain type of person. Uh, look, to be a police officer is truly public service. And I have total respect for the occupation. And I have total respect for the people who do it. You know, this is a tough job. It is a tough job, and you put your life uh, in harm's way. There's no doubt about that. And also, look at the circumstance. Today, with these video cameras and telephones that have cameras, uh, everything winds up being videotaped, right? Everything. Uh, I can tell you just personally, everything gets videotaped. You're walking in a parade, you scratch your ear, and, you know, that's on the nightly news. Everything is videotaped. So, and remember what's happening here, I already said the Attorney General is going to investigate the police conduct. So the Attorney General is investigating in real time. This is like, uh, you know, new age reality TV. You have these videos. I already told the Attorney General to do an investigation. Everything they're doing is being videotaped and is being investigated immediately because the investigation report has to be due in uh, less than a month now. So the police officers know that they're being videotaped. They know it. The protesters know they're being videotaped. So they all know that there's going to be total accountability. It's not like the old days, you know, where you had to get a tip and a rumor and this and you had to go back. It's all on videotape. So. And I've had these conversations directly with them. What you are doing is going to be on videotape tonight. So there is no pretense or hiding or maybe I'll get away with something. There's no getting away with anything. It's all on videotape. And the AG is investigating and it's happening now in real time. Say that, I'm sorry. Would body cameras provide the proper context because a lot of cell phone video or sometimes dash cam video doesn't show everything? If all officers had body cameras, would that vindicate the 
you yeah, I, I think that would be helpful. I don't think any of these things are the silver bullet, right? Uh, you look at a lot of the video that came from uh, the Mr. Floyd murder. It's from video, it's from phones, it's from observers, it's from security cameras. But uh, my point to the police and the protesters is, whatever you do, just assume that it's going to be videotaped and the attorney general is going to look at it tonight. That's where we are. Before you go out there tonight, uh, when a police officer is getting dressed, suited up, a protest is calling their friends to go out, assume we're going to watch the video tonight and the attorney general is going to watch it tonight. Uh, and if there's any potential liability, it will be immediate. Let's take one more. Joseph? I want to ask you about uh, school, school board elections are Tuesday. Uh, schools are having a difficult time either getting these ballots out, so they either want to have the vote delayed a week or to allow the votes to come in postmark Tuesday rather than delivered to the district on Tuesday. A lot of confusion out there. Are you looking at that at all? We are looking at that. We don't have a decision yet. We will over this weekend. I understand the issue. Uh, and we're looking at it, and we'll have a decision by Sunday. Thank you, guys. I'll see you tomorrow. You have to work on Saturday. You get time and a half.